Hello, I'm Rod Hatt, and welcome to CCI's online training, where we help you understand the business of coal. Welcome to Chapter 1, Coal Formation and Rank. This is where we talk about how coal forms and the different types or subcategories called ranks of coal. One of the things that's important about the rank of coal is that there are several coal properties that change with it. For one, the moisture values of the coal go down. As the coal goes down through lignite and subbituminous, it, it loses moisture. The bituminous coals, particularly the high rank bituminous coals, are actually oily and tend to shed moisture. Anthracite coal, the moisture is almost like the moisture on your windshield. It really is a low moisture product. In addition to losing moisture, the fuels also lose volatile content. Now the volatile content of a coal or a fuel is that type of gaseous or liquid material that's removed when you heat the fuel up to cherry red, but you don't let it burn. So coals like lignites and subbituminous coals are very high in volatile. The bituminous coals are sort of medium volatile. And then the low volatile coals and anthracite are very low in volatile matter. It's important to recognize that high volatile coals burn better than low volatile coals. Low volatile coals are less reactive and so therefore are harder to burn. This also means that coals like subbituminous coals and lignites can be subject to spontaneous combustion. It's because of the high volatile and high reactivity. Another aspect of the coalification process is the fuels tend to lose oxygen. The low rank coals, like lignites and subbituminous coals, are very high in oxygen. It does two things for them. One is that high oxygen provides a chemical reason for moistures to bind to the coal, but the high oxygen also poses a spontaneous combustion risk. It's almost as if the coals have their own air. As you lose more and more oxygen, you find that the coal gains calorific value. The oxygen was actually diluting the carbon. So oxygen values going down from 20 to 10 to 5 actually increase the calorific values of coals. So it's a trade-off. Highly calorific value coals tend not to burn as well or be less reactive. And the lower calorific value coals tend to burn well in fact, we have spontaneous combustion issues associated with them. I have a good question. Where does all the coal come from? And thank you for the question, Amy, because today coal formation is the subject, or what is coal? Let's talk a little bit about the history of life on Earth. The plants that evolved in the ocean in the Devonian period evolved into land plants and were well established by the Carboniferous period. Now plants use photosynthesis. They were able to capture the sun's energy and convert it into a carbon-based material. The plants digest CO2 and with the energy from the sunlight convert it into carbon. This carbon material then can be buried and if it doesn't oxidize and turn back to CO2, it can be preserved. Today, we might still see some of these same processes at work, not unlike the Mississippi River Delta. So the first land plants that grew on the land and were able to get preserved as coal were the lycopsids. And the lycopsids were like giant ferns, almost. Here's a representation of an ancient forest. Notice how not only did they have these large fern-type tree material uh, plants, but they also had very large bugs. Every once in a while we find a fossil of a large bug and that's why the bugs are drawn into this picture. Giant dragonflies and giant bugs. From the fossils associated with the coal, usually right on top of the coal seam, we actually get preserved remnants of the plant materials that the coal was made of. So mostly these large fern-like trees called lycosids uh, they were what really put down the what we call the bituminous or the coals in America from Appalachia. So the lycopsids 
you could really see blossomed during what we call the Carboniferous period. The Carboniferous period is called that because of the large amount of carbon that we find in the rocks from that time. You can see over time that these early plants that farmed coal died out. Boy, did they make good coal. Later on, the seeded uh, plants uh, occurred. The seeded plants were really good, and that's what exists today primarily, but they don't seem to make as good a coal. So our later coals, or the coals laid down not so long ago, tend to be made more from these types of materials. Notice the tremendous drop in CO2 in the Carboniferous period when these coal plants really grew. The land plants grew and put a lot of carbon into the earth. This reduction in the CO2 brought it down from thousands of parts per million to the several hundred that we're at today. But lo and behold, there are several times on Earth when the CO2 went back up again. These are generally catastrophic failures of life on Earth. We can see that recently, over the last 10, 20, 30, 40 million years, the CO2 has been going down. You can see that coal has been forming ever since land plants came on Earth and we find the fossilized remains, like this example of this fern, or this big fossil that's a lycopodia tree uh, fossilized in some Appalachian bituminous coal. More recent fossils found in coal, like this petrified wood from a lignite mine, come from a tree that where you can actually count the rings, the growth rings on it, a much more recent looking wood and one of the beautiful things about this fossil is it's been silified. It's been turned into a silicon rock. And you can actually see the crystals of silicon forming where a knot was. So the swamp and rainforest type material somehow it gets preserved. It doesn't rot away or oxidize in the air. Now keep in mind that there's a lot of eco-diversity in this forest from long ago. So not only are there different types of trees and swamps and rivers and lakes and forests, there's a tremendous amount of different types of plant material. Now over time, this plant material gets buried under rock. The rock can either form through erosion, like from mountains decomposing from glaciers and ice, or the rock can be formed by water or ocean bottoms, building up limestones like seashells or sandstones mixing in with sort of that swampy river-like material. So with the rocks on top of the plant material now, we see a transformation from the peat into a lignite material. The lignite material is often called brown coal. The lignite material is often called brown coal because it hasn't quite transformed into the black stuff we know as coal. The next step in the transformation process is called subbituminous coal. So we're starting at least to get some lower moistures and higher calorific value. With more heat and more pressure, the subbituminous coals can transform into what we call bituminous coals. The bituminous coals can exist in several different varieties, from forms that are almost like the subbituminous neighbor that, uh, that they've transformed from into, to the high volatile, high rank type coals. We even have medium and low volatile coals. Low volatile coals and medium volatile coals might be going into the metallurgical industry rather than the steam industry. And the end point of this coalification we call anthracite. Anthracite is like a piece of black glass. So generally, the higher quality coals are found under the deepest rocks. This is where erosion can help. Erosion can help remove those rocks and bring the higher quality coal up to the surface. Now these different types of coals I've been describing are the names of the rank of coal. So we use the terminology, what kind of rank is the coal, to describe whether it's a subbituminous or a bituminous type coal. One of the things that's important to recognize is that the lower ranks of coal actually burn better. They're higher reactivity. So the lignites and subbituminous coals typically have spontaneous combustion issues with them. But boy, once we get them in the boiler, they tend to burn really well. Thanks so much. I'm Rod Hatt, the president at Coal Combustion Inc., where we help you understand the business of coal.